The following episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show was recorded before the SAG after strike began. Our guest is in full support of the strike and stands in solidarity with the efforts of fellow SAG after actors in their fight for fair wages and protections. Hi, I'm composer and music director Bob Singleton, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh, and with you as always, our co-host, Chris Bixby, and Matt Bingle. How you guys doing? We're good. We're good, Jakey. How you doing? That's, that's great to hear, guys. I am doing I'm doing good. Thank you for asking. Chris, what do you have for today? Our guest for today, um, he's an actor and singer. Many uh, may know him as playing Eddie Kendricks in the Temptations miniseries. Um, he was also... Uh, he's recorded with many other artists such as uh, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, Michael Jackson, a lot of wonderful celebrities. And he uh, was a part of the group, The Alley Cats. He has his own book and his own podcast, lots of things. And here he is, Taron Brooks. Taron, happy to have you here. Glad to be here, guys. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, Happy to have awesome. you here. Happy yes. to have you here. So to kick things off in your own words, could you kind of introduce yourself a little bit and what you do? Yeah. Um, you gave me a, a great introduction, but I'm Teron Brooks. I consider myself an entertainer, I suppose. I probably have nine jobs. Uh, I'm <laughs> an actor, a singer, producer. I'm a author, motivational speaker, coach. I just creator, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I consider my greatest uh, accomplishments just being I just had my 20th wedding anniversary with my wife and I have two kids. Oh, oh nice. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Congrats. Well, the biggest things in my life are not necessarily the resume, but just the life that I that I, that I live with my family and the other stuff is extra bonus stuff. But I like to create. So maybe let's just say I'm a creator. I like to create things, make things, be a part of things that make other people better. Oh, so what was your background like and how did you grow up? I was born in Long Beach, California. I live in Los Angeles right now. Um, so I'm a native Californian. All my family lives in California. Actually, right now we live across the street from my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. <laughs> so family is always big. So um, my family moved from Long Beach where I was born to Orange County, California. And that's where I had my education and uh, really, really dived into the arts so I don't know if my parents knew that that's what they were doing, but by moving from one city to another city, it really opened up a lot of opportunity for me to learn about the arts. And I sang in church, like everybody probably says, as a singer, they started singing somewhere, but I hated it. I was very shy, <laughs> but I, th I think I had a, I had something that people uh, uh, saw, but I didn't see it. So it took going to school and having other people kind of say, hey, you want to uh, investigate what this talent you might have. So um, come from a close family. And um, but yeah, Californian raised. And um, I don't think I ever imagined that I would have a career like I have now just because I didn't think it was possible to raise family <laughs> and to make money. <laughs> um, I, I hoped it would happen. Uh but I'm very fortunate and grateful that by following my passions, um, it led me to what I'm doing right now. And having great people around me to support me through all the highs and the lows of it all makes the di makes the difference. Absolutely. Oh, of oh, yes. course. Of course it does. Definitely. So how did you first get into acting and singing? Um, The singing, like I said, was like at church. You just had to get up there and sing. So I did that all the time. Mm -hmm. Um. But the acting was like in school. They took a long time. I was in choir in high school. And then I was asked to join the um, Orange County High School of the Performing Arts. So it's a performing arts high school. So learning to, because I love to sing. I didn't know anything about acting. But learning that singing is more than just um, making music or singing notes. There's communication involved. 
that's where the acting came in, where I really wanted to master the art of storytelling and, and, and telling a story with my singing. So I said, yeah, I'll do the acting thing, not thinking I was going to be an actor, but thinking that it was going to help with the gift that I already had. Um, and so at Performing Arts High School, we had to dance and sing and learn all the different kind of uh, uh, trades in, in that performing field. So I think I maybe caught the bug when I just discussed, when I got, I was so self-conscious, you know, you're so self-conscious about yourself and people are looking at me and you make it all about you. Once I started to make it about people and what they could experience, I got free from my shyness and all of that self-consciousness and being able to say, hey, I think this is, this brings people joy. It makes me happy to bring people joy. Maybe it doesn't make me happy that people are looking at me, but um, so I think that's where it was in, in, in high school. Um, but even then, like I said, I didn't think I was going to get an agent and a manager and start doing uh, the career thing. But I think it started with the passion and the belief, like the teachers believing in me um, for that. So I did plays in high school, you know, acted in plays and musicals. Um, and then it kind of took off from there. I have a kind of a crazy story, but yeah. So who are some of your biggest influences getting into acting? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I think because I wasn't thinking about being in movies or on TV at all. It was more about theater. I'll maybe be on Broadway, maybe. Um, so there was just some like um, different actors or shows that I saw um, that would tour around. And I could say, well, I see myself in that. I think part of it is the um, the truth that I didn't see a lot of people that look like me. So I couldn't have imagine that there would be a space for me um if you ask me who my singing influences i'll say sam cook i'll say stevie wonder i'll say Smokey robinson um the list goes on i listen to a lot of gospel music in my in my house so i have a lot of gospel um influences that i love um but um as far as an acting thing sydney poitier i, I think anybody that has had a long career harry belafonte we just lost him any uh, of yeah. Those, uh, yeah. any of those people, of course, you say Denzel Washington and you say those people, but anybody that I saw that, that just wasn't just famous, but actually appreciated their craft and actually had a long life in it, I gravitated to those people because even right now, I, I want to do this for as long as I can. So I'm trying to find out who are those people that endure and what does it take to not just do something now, but to be able to do it for a long, long time and choosing the material that lasts, that people still talk about. Yeah. Nice. So now with acting, one of the roles you're most known for, of course, is playing Eddie Kendricks in the Temptations miniseries. What what was the audition process like uh, uh, for getting that role? Uh, well, uh, imagine you have no resume, you haven't done anything, and you're going to NBC Studios to uh, actually auditioned for one of the Temptations that, that actually lived, the legendary Temptations. And so imagine the audacity of putting a suit on and thinking you're going to go with all the actors, all the actors that you know, that you love, that you've seen. Imagine the audacity that you think that you might have a chance. I'll be honest, I did not think I had a chance. And that probably helped me with the nine auditions that I had to go through. The process, wow. the process was grueling in hindsight but as somebody who is just like i'm happy to be there oh they're calling me back again it i think it took the pressure off just a little bit because i really didn't understand the magnitude about what was about to happen in my life um so i always tell the story for people who are starting out in the business like hey i had nothing i went in there they saw something in me and they chose me um and so <laughs> It's kind of like a Cinderella story in that way because people don't really realize I was 23 years old when I got my biggest break of my whole life after doing a couple few things, but not enough to warrant being the star uh, of a miniseries uh, that people still watch today all over the, the world. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So before working on the miniseries, what was your familiarity with The Temptations? Uh, I knew, of course, my dad, you know, played the Temptations. I love the Temptations uh, as a band, but I don't think I knew the story. Um, it, there's such a tragic story. Uh, obviously, you know that the only uh, surviving member is Otis Williams. He's the only one alive and they all pretty much died um, for various reasons. Um, 
to me that didn't have to happen, you know? Um, so no, I didn't know the intricacies of this of the story, but they had such a bond. And that's, if you see the movie, you'll see, I think people are more touched with the brotherhood of these men that um, went through a lot. Imagine somebody just giving you a million dollars or a record deal or an opportunity of a lifetime and imagine you not being ready. That's kind of what happened. People hear the music, they see the talent, but they don't realize that those young kids, 17 and 18, when it started, did not have the psych psyche or the maturity or the grooming uh, to understand how am I going to help under celebrity and wealth. So it's a commentary today, too. I think a lot of young people watch the movie who want to be an artist to kind of see what's the behind the scenes story of a group that's so popular even to this day, but then they're not even around to um partake in such of the the love that they have. So to answer your question, of course, everybody knows My Girl. Everybody knows The Temptations. You heard it. My parents played the music. You know, I knew that that was iconic, but I did not know the adversity uh, and the challenges. I think that happens a lot when we love someone. We love stars. Beyonce, yeah, but she's a person. There's things going on in her life that you probably could not imagine um, because we kind of leave, leave the, live these normal lives. So do you have any like favorite scenes from either parts? Um, I, I, I have some favorite scenes that are probably beloved by people that watch it. Cause when I walk on the street, somebody will yell out, you know, um, I'm not going on without Paul or whatever, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, uh, what's it to you, Shelly? You know, I think Eddie, Eddie was a sweet soul, right? But if you crossed him and his friends and somebody that he loved, he, he was like a true, true, true friend. And so my probably my favorite scenes were the ones where I asserted myself <laughs> and and got in somebody's face and said, hey, we don't do it like that because Eddie wanted things to be fair and just and right. And if you've seen the movie, you know, Eddie was best friends with Paul and they right. kicked Paul. Paul had all these adversities and challenges. And Eddie was like, there's no temptations without Paul. You can't kick him out. Um, and how Eddie's journey had to go from losing his friend and to continue on with something that he loved and try to keep it just at the same time. So my favorite, I laugh at those scenes where I'm kind of up in somebody's face. <laughs> I'm telling somebody. <laughs> <off>. <laughs> Definitely. Now, so I'm kind of curious, how, how long did it take to learn like all the songs and the dance moves? I feel like we filmed for maybe three months and it took a month to learn the dancing and the singing. And you have to imagine if you're going to do the temptation story, you, there is no movie. If you don't, if you can't dance and sing and do the, <laughs> do the job, there's no movie, you know? So mm -hmm. um, fortunately I must say, I got to sing some of the actors, we got the part and then we had to audition to sing. So mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to get the part and also, uh, it's probably 90% me in the movie. People don't know that it's not Eddie singing the whole thing. It's me. Um, and some of my other co-stars got to sing a little bit or whatever. But that, I have to say that. So it was an honor to be able to do that. But to answer your question, yeah, every day, eight hours a day, sweating, learning the choreography, um, learning the songs, recording the songs. So, and for me, I should go back and say that was a fun part for me because I wasn't nervous about singing and performing. I'd, I'd already done that. Right. Um, so it was the acting thing probably was newer to me. Where do I stand and what do I do? And uh, my co-stars really helped me with that. But I think I was able to help a little bit with the performance part of it because I wasn't new to that part. So, right. um, but yeah, we worked really, really, really hard. We did have an obligation to not be a knockoff group or knockoff version, but to actually be the Temptations. And that was a tall order. Yeah, I can oh, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. So overall, how did it feel to portray a member of such an iconic singing group? Uh, overall, I, I, I just have so much. I have so much pride in the in knowing that the people that knew him, the feedback that I've received from people that knew him, um, I mean, Smokey Robinson told me I was the ghost of his friend, you know, like you can't get better than that when people know the person and they tell you that you um, or one of his relatives said I moved my head like him or things that I did not try to do. Because um, I think when you're portraying someone, you can do an imitation. I tried to mm -hmm. do 
an embodiment of Eddie Kendricks. I could not not imitate him. I didn't want to. I wanted to get his characteristics and get his spirit. Um, and fortunately, um, the producers saw that. I, I auditioned for Paul originally, and then they they switched it and said, no, this he's Eddie Kendricks. So to answer your question, I think the pride I have that I have done something special mm -hmm. for people that knew him brings me joy. Obviously, everyone thinks they know him because he's an icon, but those close personal relationships to say, gosh, maybe I got it right for for them really made the difference for me. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's especially to consider you were saying earlier, you, you don't want to be a knockoff. You know, you mm. you can't. You just can't. You can't. You can't. And if you go in doing that, there's a little bit of a narcissist thing to say that I'm going to imitate. It, it's kind of not the right approach. I no. don't. You miss so much by just saying, oh, I'll watch some videos and I'll just sing and move. That's that's only as, as far as you can go if you're going to imitate someone who's a real person. So you have to do some homework as an actor to say, what are the similarities that I have with Eddie Kendricks and what are the differences? And uh, really like dive into that a little bit. And so when the camera's rolling, I I am becoming Eddie Kendricks. I'm not acting like Eddie Kendricks, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. Of course. So now moving on from the Temptations, you've also done a lot of uh Broadway acting, as you mentioned, including playing Simba in The Lion King on Broadway. What what was that experience like? That was my debut. My debut on Broadway was um The Lion oh. King. That's another funny story of like seven auditions and going back and being told no and I always joke and say, it's just a lion. Like I can be a lion, you know, <laughs> <What's the deal? laughs> so I'm, I'm going to come back. You can't tell me no, you know? Right. Um, so I um, played Simba on Broadway and I played Simba here at, in Los Angeles at the Pantages for um, a little while. Uh, it was a great experience. The Lion King is still going on. They're probably celebrating their 25th, 30th, 27th anniversary too. They've been on Broadway for a long, long time. So yeah. That show is beautiful. I always tell people it's not the movie. It's not a cartoon. It's an artistic theatrical museum. <laughs> you really got to yeah. go. Yeah. So for that being my first show, it, it was, you know, very gratifying. Uh, you know, but I my the theme is is persistence and resilience. You have to you have to really keep trying and putting yourself out there. It's not gonna sometimes it's that one time, sometimes it's that one call, and sometimes it's like, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna try again. If it's if it's something that you really want, of course, I've had to let go of some things that that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you also got to play seaweed in the first U.S. national tour of Hairspray. What was that like? Oh, that was crazy. I remember sitting with my friend um, watching Hairspray because my friend was in it. And my friend was like, you're going to oh. beat that. And, you know, if you've seen Hairspray, <laughs> it's a dance show. And I'm a movie, oh, yeah. I feel like I can move well and fake you out but i'm not like dance 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 so hairspray is a dance show and i'm watching it never thinking i'm going to be seaweed the best dancer in that show you know <laughs> and um it happened a year later i had an audition a couple auditions and i got the role and it worked so hard i probably should say that's one of my proudest moments because when the reviews would come back they would talk about my dancing and not my singing and then my co-stars would always be saying, oh, Tehran, you know, sorry they didn't mention your singing. I was like, you guys don't understand. If they're talking about my dancing, it's amazing, <laughs> you know. Um, mm -hmm. But that show in particular was incredibly fun to do and always a joy, even if you were tired or sick or you didn't feel well. You just, it was, and I have to say the creatives and the, sometimes the show is not just the actors, it's also the management and the producers. And they were so lovely and great. I'm actually going to take my daughter this Sunday to see Hairspray. Um, so we're going to sit together. That's going to be wow. oh, nice. That's fantastic. That's, that's and because, wonderful. Hey, your dad did that 80, 85 years ago. <laughs> 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 so... You also starred in a musical, The Soul of Broadway, Impossible Dreams. Can you uh, talk a bit about that? Yeah, that's actually not a musical, but it's I created the show. It's like a concert experience called, oh. Soul, called Soul of Broadway, where we take uh, popular songs, uh, admittedly songs that I actually do not love, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and we take them out of the context of the musical. Like if it's Annie, I'm singing The Sun Will Come Out mm -hmm. Tomorrow. 
but I'm singing right. it in the context of uh, of a story of my life, of my challenges raising my kids or whatever. And I sing these songs in a whole new reimagined way. Um, so the listener doesn't have to go, oh, that's from that show, or that's from that show, or what that's from that show. They get more of an experience of what the lyrics and what the, because uh, whether you hate Broadway or not, not Broadway is, 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 is known for telling stories, you know? So right. I just chose different shows that I thought would be able to fit into one show and tell an overarching uh, story. So I love it because it puts me on display with all the talent that I have because I'm not just a one trick per person, you know? Um, and then I always thought, hey, what if I sang the song in the way that I interpreted? What if, wh how would that sound? So I'm excited about that because that's also putting me in the producer creative role and not just here's the song and here's the script, something that I was able to create. And we've been able to do that all over Los Angeles. We've toured all over the country. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that show. It, we, you can get it on uh, uh, streaming, it, wherever you stream. The, the album is called The Soul of Broadway. Um, and it's pretty rebellious. Most people love it. Some people are true enthusiasts. You know, they love their phantom the way that they love it. And uh, we're very rebellious. We go, oh, sorry, oops. We might have ruined it for you. <laughs> 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 so on to more of your singing work. You've had the pleasure of, as Chris mentioned in the introduction earlier, working with many other artists, some of which include Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, Michael Jackson, among many, many others. Can you share any stories from singing with them? Uh, well, I'll give you a couple stories. One, I also toured with Phil Collins. I think that was probably the best thing ever. Oh, I love Phil Collins. Oh, uh, yes. Phil nice. on tour with such a humble, he was so humble. Um, and so advocating to his whole band and singers is such extraordinary. And we did, he did a Motown record. Basically he loved Motown as a child. So he recreated literally um, his favorite Motown records to the T <laughs> um, and hired all of us. And we went to uh, Switzerland, the Montrose Jazz Festival and New York City. And um, uh, I didn't get to sing Phil Collins music, but we did get to do the Motown music. But my takeaway from that is from him is kindness is that you can be the biggest star in the world and still be kind. Some people have trouble doing that, but Phil Collins is like a class act in, um, in kindness and sharing the stage. I got to do it with him on tour. And that was like crazy. Um, any, any obstacle, I mean, any uh, opportunity when I sang with Stevie wonder, did I sing or was I going, Oh my gosh, it's Stevie wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Probably should have gotten fired because I don't know how much I sang or how much I was really looking. Um, Smoking Robinson, again, I from The Temptations because he was actually in The Temptations. And I met him before working with him. I got to sing six songs on his album and really like work with him, have lunch with him and Randy Jackson. And they told me stories about the business. And so that's what I mean about these icon, iconic people you don't just get the talent that you love. Hopefully, if they're willing, they'll give you a little morsel of like how it came to be and who who they've worked with. And so you can use that on your journey. So those three things, Stevie and and Smokey and Phil, there's been others, but those really stick out in my mind about how I want to have my career, how I want to treat people and uh, just those amazing blessings. I mean, I don't take it for granted. That, that's a, that that is a possibility and was a possibility for me. And I'll say hey, most of those experiences come from other people recommending me because people ask me all the time, well, how do you get in the business and blah, blah, blah. And when I was young and they used to say, it's all who you know, I used to get very mad at that answer, but it's very true. It's very true. It's not just who you know, meaning you just need to know someone, but it's like, what do they know about you that they're saying, hey, Tehran is this, 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 you want to, you want to work with him. And most of the time, the singing or the talent is the last thing that they're asking. They're probably asking, is he cool? Is he on time? Does he have any integrity? Like, do I want him on tour with me? You know, and um, so I do every job. I, I remember that, that this is an impression. It could be for later. And the same thing for me when I wanted to recommend somebody. It's like, well, they can sing and they're the best actor. But I sure don't know if I want to say that they can have this job. So. Um, I went on a tangent, but yeah, those three people, <laughs> incredible, incredible. And you're pinching yourself all along. 
wrong. You know, you, there's never a moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're never going, oh, this is feels good, comfortable. You're still. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So you were also a member of the doo group, the Alley Cats. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I, obviously that probably helped with the temptations and all of that. The Alley Cats. Wow. I started that way, way when I was young, 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 with friends of mine. That's a cappella group. We sang doo music, went all over festivals. Um, and so that's where, and the, the, the Alley Cats, they, I think they still perform today. They're known for their spontaneity and their comedy. So as you were singing the Duke of Earl or whatever 50, 60 song we're singing, we're making jokes. And I wasn't used to that. I was like, just give me the mic and I'll sing. So I wasn't used to like messing up and stopping the song and doing these antics to make people laugh. So it kind of gave me a little bit of a fun, um, uh, class on performing you know because it's not just the singing and most people who love the alley cats love the music but they also love the personalities you know um and i became kind of the straight man in the group because i didn't really know what the joke was but i was just like hey guys you know so everybody was like laughing at me because i didn't really know what i was doing <laughs> um but there's nothing like acapella singing getting your note on a pitch pipe and just singing for like an hour with no music and making your voice do the music. So uh, I've been in a lot of groups uh, in my, in my time. Um, and when the chemistry is there, it's, it's, it's great. Definitely. And we were, we were, we didn't get a Grammy, but we were on the Grammy ballad for one of the songs that I sang called tears on, wow. on, on your pillow. Uh, so it, we didn't, you know, there's a big Grammy process, but we were on the long mm -hmm. list of people. Right. Oh, that's awesome. Ah, that's cool. That's cool. So you've also produced your own albums, a few of them, including uh, Prelude and Overture. Uh, can you talk about them and how they came about? Yeah, I mean, if to me, the greatest expression is your own, <laughs> you know, um, making your own. If you're an artist of any kind, I tell people, well, people, I don't write and I don't do this. I go, you have to try. You know, there has to be a moment as an artist where your voice has to come through, you know? And if you are working in collaboration with someone else's vision, like we often have to do, you can get like a little bit glimpses of yourself. You put yourself in there, but there's nothing like um, creating something on your own. Even if you fail, I always say, even if people don't like it, that's not my business, but my business is to say, this is what I wanted to say. So I do have a few albums on iTunes that I've produced and co-produced and written. Um, and they've been my greatest joy. They're like children. You know, it's like I, I can say something in, to the world that I want to say. And I have to learn, uh, like, I don't love everything that people might not love everything that I do as well. So yeah, it's hard though now. When you guys know, like, to make a record, if you're if you're an independent artist and you don't have a label, all of that money and all of that time, and for what? You know, it's like everything is so fast on social media. You put a single out, and hopefully, people heard it that day because the next day it's gone. You know, mm -hmm. so I really had to change the my thinking about I'm gonna get famous. I'm gonna get a record deal. I'm gonna make a lot of money. It's just <laughs> not happened <laughs> yet. So I make music because I love it and I'm fortunate on occasion to be able to get money together and produce and give an offering to people of my thoughts. That's how I look at it right now as a mm. call card right now. You all can go right now and type my name in and listen to some music and find out more about me. It's more of an introduction than it is. I'm going to be rich and famous. And, and um, <laughs> that's been a journey to understand from when I started to now how, right. how Definitely. Mm -hmm. So aside from acting and singing, you also worked in communication as a life coach. How did that, how did that come into play for you? Well, I figure if I do that every day, I should get paid. Like if I do that with my friends, like <laughs> yeah, <I> should, <laughs> talking to people. Um, no, I'm joking. I, I, I really say people ask me what I want to do. I, I say that I want to be the singing Oprah Winfrey. So everything that Oprah is as a uh, teacher and a communicator and a speaker and an encouraging force, just add the singing to that. And that's what I want to be. 
Um, so I just think I kind of fell into that knowing that I do have some wisdom and basically the wisdom comes from your own experiences, right? You yeah. Can't, right. You, you can't just say, you know, everything, or you have an opinion about things. You can only speak from your own experiences. And I don't, I am not ashamed of my life or the choices that I made or the mistakes or whatever I made. I, I rather use those to help somebody else. And so I'm very candid about my life and my struggles and my what's going on. Cause I, I don't care what you think about me as an artist or whatever, or a person. Um, but nine out of the 10, it helps somebody when you can be vulnerable. So um, I'm learning on being a better listener, but yeah, the life coaching is something that I still want to do. Um, but I tell you this, a lot of people don't invest in them in themselves. So they might see my fee and go, Oh, I don't want to pay for that, which is fine. It's not like you're paying because I'm all that you're paying to invest in yourself to get healing and to, to help yourself on a journey. And, um, I feel sad that people don't want to take that investment, uh, in themselves. Just tell the truth, be open, uh, and face what you need to face so you can go through it. Because if you don't, year 10 and 11, all those things that you ignore are still right there and you have not moved forward. So it's better just to face it right. and be, be more open to your humanness because we're not perfect. Once I started to do that, my life changed. I just basically tell people I'm a mess. Hi, I'm Tehran, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You wrote your own book, Something Good on the Table, Practical Proverbs for the Soul. Can you talk a little bit about that book? Yeah, I mean, that was an easy one, kind of. I wrote every day. Those are just quotes. I just said, I'm going to write for a year. And then on December 31st, um, you know, I think it was the year 2017, I stopped writing and I put it in a book. And uh, I think that's the wonderful thing about being independent. And, you know, I didn't. I was self-published through Amazon.com. There's nobody looking at me telling me what to do, you know. And there's some kind of cool thing about that. I would love to go to the next level with the book I'm doing now when it get published and everything and you have to answer to people. But there's something really cool about making your own decision, saying this is the book, this is the cover, this is what I want to say and putting it on Amazon and having people buy it. So um, I, I put some song lyrics in there and then I, I I used to hate reading. You know, it took a long time for me to like enjoy it. And now I love it so much just because I gravitate to things that interest me. So what I like to do when I write anything is make it, simple enough where you could read just two pages that day and that would be enough for you to get some inspiration that was mm -hmm. my goal with that book so a lot of the pages just have like one quote on it or two quotes on it and that's it so it can be something that you can pick up flip through something good on the table is just what it is you throw it on your table and when people come over they go what is that oh something good for you um that's where i got the title for that so i'm proud of that i try to do things that are not as easy uh, and the, anything that I'm afraid of, I have to do, you know. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And you also have your, I mentioned in the beginning, you also have your own podcast, Honest Answers with Toron Brooks. How, how did you first start that? That was a lifelong dream that I really wanted to, to do. Uh, and so I started to have, uh, I had the idea to get a lot of my friends, my, you know, industry friends or whatever to talk with me in a way that they may not talk with other people to almost forget that they were revealing things that they may not want to reveal. <laughs> um, so we had some great conversations just being real, like a telephone conversation. And then that was the podcast. So um, I did that about two years ago. Um, I haven't done another season. I really want to. There's a, you guys know, come on, there's a lot of work that goes. Into oh yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah, oh, definitely, definitely oh a lot of work for sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. So people don't realize that. And it's not that I don't want to do the work or it's not that I don't need it to be perfect. I think sometimes I have to evaluate when you have a lot going on, the importance of what you're going to do. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Getting ready to do the second season and I just I didn't feel it. And so I wanted to listen to myself instead of saying, I have to do this. Everyone's waiting for a second season, which who's everyone. I just listened to myself and said, the time is not right. You know, and that's when you do good things, which you guys have your thing. You can go back and listen to the people that I had and it still can be relevant to right now, even though I don't have another season yet, um, because I made sure that I put a lot of 
energy and what I did, if that makes sense. So right. I'm proud yeah. of it. Um, I'm proud. We wrote a theme song for the podcast that's actually going on, going on my new record called Honest. Uh, so, you awesome. know, I do a lot of spur of the moment things and some things continue and some things was like, well, that was a season that was a time. I'd love to have my own show. Uh, obviously, it's probably the goal for me to really have my own real show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. My life is for 35 years in the business has have always has always been an adventure. I have dreams and I have goals, of course, but I'm always like open to something unexpected or another door that takes me to another place. And I think if you do that, you have a bigger uh, career or a bigger growth opportunity than being so bent on, I got to do this. I got to do this. Um, and no shade to anybody that has those specific goals, but life isn't right. always like that. It doesn't all. And what do you do in the meantime when you're waiting for the record deal? You know, you got to try to do something else. So I'm pretty excited about anything that you've read on my resume. A lot of that stuff has been accidental. <laughs> and basically <laughs> happened because I was open. If I was like, oh, I'm just going to sing, I would have never gone for an audition for a movie because I would have said, that's not what I'm doing. That's not what I'm doing, you know? So I kind of right. just take it as it take it as it comes. I'd love to go back to Broadway again. Awesome, yeah. Because I know uh, recently Broadway's been opening back up. You know, with the pandemic kind of slowly starting to make its way out and everything. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the pandemic is over. <laughs> I mean, in people's minds, everything is pretty back. But I think the pandemic still there's still a mentality. Yeah, that we all will carry yeah. with us forever, no matter if we're back. Well, there's still a kind of a slowness to social socialization, communication. Yeah. Um, but as an artist, I'm happy um, that that Broadway's back, and you know we're on strike, the writer strike, so that's gonna yeah. be yeah, hmm. that, that people have to go through. But it's necessary. It's necessarily when things change, things change. That's you know, right. Just, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very that's interesting. But fortunately for me, like we've talked about for the last few minutes, I've been able to create. So when things shut down, I'm not I'm not shut down because I can create something. I'm not waiting for someone to give me a job because I can create it. That's my wish for people, you know, because you never know what the future holds. Definitely. Definitely. So what would you like to say to those who have supported the projects you've worked on over the years? Oh, I just I'm in immense gratitude, I immense gratitude for following the journey and letting me know there'll be days with, of discouragement and one day you'll get an encouraging text or dm or whatever from someone and it 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 really matters so that's what i would want to say that it really matters um because the day that it doesn't matter i start to question <laughs> what <laughs> am i you know so every person i always say that if if you are coming to see me sing or perform or follow me or whatever it's a broadway show every time because you're valuable you spent your money you spent your time it's not like oh that's just one person or i don't know them i treat everybody like this is the biggest thing ever um because people deserve that when they follow you and i have some good lifelong fans and friends that really uh support what i do and we can't do it without them so very very appreciative right definitely so if people would like to connect with you where can people find you uh, don't laugh, but Facebook, I'm on Facebook and I'm not ashamed. <laughs> uh, so I, Facebook or Instagram, I actually type back, I write back, um, or you can go to my website, teronbrooksofficial.com. Like you guys found me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wrote back, didn't I? I said, Hey, yeah. you know, uh, so <laughs> just, yeah, definitely people reach out and I would definitely reach out on, um, uh, all those social media platforms. I'm actually actively, um, looking for that communication and that connection nice nice and link nice. to your website and social media will be in the description down below for people to connect with you Perfect. so since we're about to wrap up the last question that matt's about to ask is a question that we ask all of our guests at the end yes interview. yes so of course this podcast is called jake's happy nostalgia show when you think of nostalgia what do you think of or how would you define the word nostalgia oh uh, well, first thing I just think about when I think of nostalgia is time, timeless, you know, and what 
what I love about nostalgia is like you call it the happy. Would you say it's the hat? Jake's happy. You know, it's Jake's happy Jake's nostalgia, happy nostalgia show. show. That is tied into nostalgia because sometimes you have to go back and remember something. And that makes you so happy. That moment is in your brain of a, of a TV show, a movie, a song. For me, a lot of times it's songs that yeah. I'll just, for example, it was my 20th anniversary and I sang this, the, the song Sade by your side. That was our first dance. So I got to sing that at my concert on our anniversary last Thursday. Uh, just by uh, song, you can create a moment, a memory of happiness, right? Instantly putting yourself back in that position. So when I think of the word nostalgia to answer your question, I think of timeless. And I actually do think of happiness of, of, of a certain time that you can carry on no matter where you go. It just kind of doesn't end. It doesn't stop there. That's kind of what it is with the temptations. It's like, that's been 25 years old and people are still watching it for the first time or seeing it or whatever. They have mm -hmm. that thing. They saw Eddie Kendricks or when they saw the temptations for real or when they saw the temptations recently and they they it brings them so much joy um i get to do that for them even though i'm not eddie kendricks but i can see how that nostalgic does kind of uh make people feel great awesome definitely great word signed on mm -hmm. oh, well teron thank you so much for taking the time to do this this is really fun yes thank you very much hey. awesome. Yes. Awesome. everything you guys are doing Oh, thank, thank you, you so thank much. you thank you thank you very much it means a lot thank, you, thank you so much for for what you've done to be a part of our lives and keep up the great work and can i can i wait for what what's next what's next in store for you you know when this is airs or comes on right yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, you know absolutely keep in touch teron enjoy the rest of your day Thanks, guys. later all right yeah. later see you teron take care and it's goodbye from us as well yes indeed yes indeed well I absolutely enjoyed our time with teron brooks because you know again i'm you know, I'm a fan of The Temptations and I grew up watching the miniseries. We watched it in high school years ago. Um, so, you know, that's, wow. you know, it's always fun getting to, you know, like with all these interviews, it's always fun getting to talk to someone who we've looked up to for, you know, years and years yeah. and years. And hearing their stories as well. It's really wonderful. Okay. Yes. But, yep. But to end this off, what do we say, Jake? Keep massage our lives. See you next time for more episodes. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.